All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, so it's uh, my, my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Craig Hensley. Most of you probably know Craig. I'd say raise your hand if you don't know him. Most of you know him. Uh, he's a lifelong naturalist and educator. He's uh, shared his passion and love for the natural world with audiences from Minnesota and Nebraska to across Texas. He served as a Texas nature trackers biologist for Comal and Kennel counties and for more than eight years as the park interpreter at Guadalupe River State Park. He's the father of son, Dr. Noah Hensley, a senior technical advisor for the National Water Regulator Tamawata Aroai in New Zealand. How did I do? Okay. All right. <laughs> and uh, his daughter, Dr. Jennifer Hensley, a pediatrician in the Boston area. And he's grandfather to four granddaughters and one grandson. And he's married to Hill Country Master Naturalist Terry Lashley, who's absent tonight. So uh, anyway, so Terry was my mentor a couple of years ago when I uh, went through the classes. And so um, I, she got me into watching bird boxes uh, out at Cibolo Nature Center. And so we were out there one day and there's uh, somebody else with us and we're on the uh, west side of the Cibolo Creek and uh, it's like nine or 10 in the morning and we um, heard a barred owl and we thought, well, that's kind of unusual to be hearing a barred owl in the daytime like this. And after a minute, Terry said, wait a minute, I think that's Craig. <laughs> and she she pulled out her phone and said, Craig, is that you? <laughs> he said, yes, it is. So I asked Craig if his pipes were clear, he could uh, give us a barred owl uh, hoot uh, this morning before he started. Is that okay? Okay. All right. He'll be warmed up by then. <laughs> all right. But uh, it was a uh, very real. Yeah. Very realistic. Um not quite, re <laughs> not quite realistic enough to um, to fake all the the real the real kind out. Uh, so Terry tells me he's he was out one time um, communicating with a female of the species, and they were talking back and forth until another male started hooting, and then that female started corresponding over there instead of the Craig. So she had it figured out, but uh, I couldn't have figured it out anyway. <laughs> Enough of me. Here's Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a heads up. The last three weeks, every presentation I've given from um, Belton to Conroe to around here, there have been so many screw-ups with technology. So um, it, to the point where Saturday night I was in Bastrop, opened my computer and the uh, screen was broken um, through a stupid accident. So uh, if anything goes wrong tonight, don't blame. There's no blame there. It's it's the aura that I'm carrying around right now. So uh, hopefully nothing will happen. This, hopefully we'll break the, the trend tonight. So, uh, But uh, thank you for the opportunity to come talk with you. And, and Terry, by the way, would be here if it weren't for the fact that she's in Iowa uh, helping my parents um, settle into assisted living. So she's uh, she's a way better organizer than I and offered to go up there. And my parents dearly love her probably more than me. And uh, so she's wrestling with that kind of stuff right now. So um, so tonight what I'm going to try to do, I am going to talk a little bit about City Nature Challenge and about who, what our program is. And then uh, we're going to focus on, of course, reptiles, and particularly the second half of the program, we'll talk about snakes, but I want to introduce some of the other uh, reptiles as well. So um, hopefully this will be end up being uh, worth, worth your time and uh, that you'll learn a few things tonight. If you have any questions in the audience here, don't hesitate to ask. And if you have questions online, we'll get to your questions at the end of the presentation. So, Okay. So um, I work for Texas Nature Trackers Program. There are two of us now. We just hired our, our replacement uh, biologist. Her name is Wendy Anderson, and she's working out of um, uh, Austin. She's going to be covering the north half of the state, and I'm going to be covering the south half of the state, which is cool because if I ever get called out to Big Bend, I get to go. Um, 
but but she gets the panhandle, and I'm kind of bummed by that. I, I like the panhandle. Um, but uh, we are part of the wildlife diversity program, which is basically the program that includes all the non-game biologists, uh, the folks that do the mapping and and setting or creating uh, models for tracking wildlife. Wendy used to do that for her first five or six years in the program. And um, uh, our particular team is called the Community Stewardship and Engagement Team. And my boss is your boss, Michelle Haggerty. I think hopefully all of you know Michelle. Yes, okay. Um, she's awesome to work for. And uh, there's a team of four of us. And there's one other person that does. We're just new, a new hire that's starting next week, actually, um, uh, that does our video productions and things like that. So. Um, and what we try to do now, why did it go back to that? It went back. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Thank you. There we go. No, see, I, oh, this is one of those weird ones, but it's working. So stop complaining. Um, all right. So what we do is we try to engage what our program is intended to do is to get as many people to become community scientists as possible. That means getting out and tracking uh, flora and fauna across the state. We use the tool iNaturalist. How many of you are using iNaturalist or have used it or have thought of heard of it? Good Lord, people, everybody's hand in this room should be up. So that tells me that we still have work to do if we can't even get master naturalist to use it. Um, um, but we, <laughs> so we try to get people to engage through master Na or through iNaturalist and, um, it's a great app. It's a great app. And, and I will tell you, it's a great app for our conservation purposes, but it's also a great app just to learn about the world around you. Um, in terms of pointing at it, taking a picture of something and it's suggesting IDs of the plants and animals anywhere in Texas. It's not hundred percent right, but it does pretty darn good. And then we go and uh, through our program, we grab some of that data off iNaturalist of species called uh, or animals and plants called species of greatest conservation need. And we take that data and get it to the research and conservation community in the hopes that they can then put apply that information to make better conservation decisions. So again, what we're trying to do through our projects, we have 12 of them, is to get that good data do the analysis on it, send it off. Eventually, it, hopefully it ends up in the Texas Natural Diversity Database, which is a public database that shows rare plant communities and species across the state. It's a public, well, it's a public website, but right now you have to get permit, you have to ask permission to get data off of it. But the reason this is here, so let's say TxDOT is going to put in a road somewhere. TxDOT's required by law to go to the Texas Natural Diversity Database and make sure that if they're putting a road someplace that there aren't rare or endangered species or plant communities in the way. And if they are, then they have to try to figure out how to mitigate that. Uh, in terms of our 12 projects, the one that we're here tonight a little bit more about is the Herps of Texas. This has been probably our leading project in terms of the amount of data that we've collected. Um, there are no specific Texas Parks and Wildlife programs to collect uh, much research data on, on reptiles and amphibians across the state. We have a state herpetologist, and he focuses on a few species a year. But this, this particular project, we get a, a lot of observations, and, a, and there are a fair number of SGCN uh, in the state, uh, reptile amphibian-wise. And so you can see right there the herps of Texas. These are just some of our projects just the last three fiscal years. Um, we've had more than 6,000, now it's, of course that number's gone up, but more than 6,000 SGCN observations uh, just on the Herps of Texas alone. And what this means is if, if the public weren't contributing this data, we wouldn't have this data. So because there aren't biologists out there, there's one biologist per county, they don't have time to be tracking every reptile and amphibian and, or every bird or anything else um, in the state. So... This is where community scientists really do have a large impact on the amount of data we can get and better our understanding. Species of greatest conservation need. 
And what that is, is a, is a plant or animal that is in decline or in trouble and gets identified as that by our taxobiologists so that we can then start to put emphasis towards those species to try to reverse that declining role, that decline that they're experiencing. And the goal of that is to, to get to them before they have to be listed as, as threatened state or federally threatened or endangered species. Our goal is to not have any threatened or endangered species. Not, you know, that's our, that's our goal. Um, and that's what we try to work towards. Yes. Database. Yep. Yeah, text is required by law to, to go to that. But if you wanted to, um, you could make a request for data from that. Um, and, and, you know, if you were interested in a particular, let's say, golden cheek warbler, and you wanted some data on golden cheek warbler presence or documented records, you could make a, a, an official request to get that data. So this is uh, just the Herps of Texas project. This is all reptiles and amphibians, not just the SGCNs, but all of them. Um, and with the, in the first few years of the project, over 5,000 SGCN observations went into that project. So many for a couple of species that we were able to reduce, take them off the state threatened list. Uh, and that, again, is mostly because of the public being out there taking pictures. Uh, or recording sounds. And we've got probably another thousand right now records ready to go uh, into the data or go to the database folks for them to process. And we do have our own web page. And if you want to find out more about those projects, you can you can click on that link right there that says, well, it says projects. Um, and then there's target species that we're trying to look for. And then getting involved gets us to talking about um, things like City Nature Challenge and other ways to get involved with our program. And we also do have social media uh, on both Instagram and Facebook. So you can follow us on both of those things. And we try to have uh, interesting posts all the time. And occasionally you see some weird dude with a video talking about stuff. Well, that'd be me. I wouldn't call anybody else a weird dude. Uh, um, well, I could, but not in public. <laughs> Target species are our species of greatest conservation need that we think the public could actually help us gather data on. There's over thir just over 1,300 species on that list right now. Um, the new list is going to be published hopefully within the next few months, and that number is going to drop um, because they're tightening up their um, qualifications, if you will. And a lot of them are invertebrates that live in underground caves and things like that. So And, and so we select target species of things that well, here's the general public could actually run into that one versus a cave dwelling, you know, critter that, yeah, or even smaller, like a, you know, a, a cricket or something like that. So that's what the target species is for. Thanks for asking that question. So City Nature Challenge, you've already been introduced to it. It was, did start as a friendly competition. Uh, this year, there's going to be just over 500 metropolitan areas globally that are going to participate and this is, and like I said, it's friendly competition. So Dallas and Houston fight all the time over who gets, who wins. San Antonio has a undeclared challenge against Austin. I don't think either one of those cities really care that much. I mean, in terms of the competition, uh, but I do. Um, and I, and I, this is the first time I've been in the San Antonio area in a while. And I've been out in other areas, including the Austin area promoting this. So you people need to pick up your pace here in Kirk County because I, uh, I tried to discourage the people in the other cities from participating to help us out. But you guys have to step it up um, to make it work out. And, of course, I'm just joking. Um, but it is four days. It starts midnight Friday and goes through midnight Monday. Um, and it, all it is is an opportunity to encourage people to get out and explore nature, whether it's in their backyard, whether it's in uh, the local park wherever it happens to be, um, and just document things on iNaturalist. You can see last year in Texas, we had almost 150,000 observations of over 7,500 species. So that's pretty good, actually. Um, not all of them are SGCN, but a fair number are. So this is a, as much a public engagement thing as it is anything. Uh, but we do get some data off of it. Globally, there are almost 1.7 million observations. 
Um, we're kind of lucky here that they do it when they do it here, because in other parts of the world, it's winter. So they don't get very many observations, sadly. Um, the, one of the things that we've discovered that this participating in this event and encouraging it is that it actually increases people's usership of iNaturalists. If they really get into this, then they stay engaged. Uh, to the point where we have some people that are now super users that actually do their own workshops on training people on iNaturalist. So they've really bought in. The other thing it does is it leverages um, the work that our biologists can do. So in Houston, back in 2020, we calculated at 84 community scientists to every one TPWD biologist. Um, that's a lot of potential new data that we can gather that that one biologist simply can't. So we find it to be a pretty valuable event. And in other places like the lower Rio Grande Valley, they take all their data and they crank out this amazing report. Um, and different cities and, and metropolitan areas can use this data however they want to promote conservation, to get enga engage more people in their local communities. So if you want to, you can go to our webpage and under where it said get involved, you'll find our webpage that shows what's going on with the 2023 City Nature Challenge. Vern's got his phone going, so I'll get, let him get a picture. Uh, and again, it's Friday, April 28th through Monday, May 1st. These are all the 15 metropolitan areas that are participating. You'll know that you'll notice that um, San Antonio is trying to get all the way to the Gulf Coast because we know that San Antonio, the Gulf Coast is part of San Antonio, right? Um, and this, la this year, we actually had requests to add all these counties up here. Uh, we thought maybe that was getting a little too far away from city the city concept. Um, however, uh, there's nothing to say that these, and since you guys have such a big chapter and cover a lot of counties, all of these counties could band together, including Kirk County and create their own if they wanted to. There are no like, you can't do that or you can't. Okay. So this is kind of free will. And if you're not in one of those areas, um, you can actually join the global project and you can still enter information during that four day period. All right, let's talk reptiles. So there are lots of different reptiles, obviously. Um, and you'll find when you work with the general public that a lot of them don't know the difference between a reptile and amphibian. Um, seriously. Um, I don't know what they're teaching in science anymore, but um, apparently it's not that. Um, but we have everything from lizards to turtles to the croc or the alligator to snakes and skinks, which of course are classified with the lizards. Um, and characteristics of reptiles, general characteristics, they have scaly skin. They are cold-blooded or pochiliotherms. They lay leathery eggs if they lay eggs. Um, and they also, some of them are live bearing. So uh, I, I witnessed one time a garter snake give birth and that was weird. Um, and this was a normal colored garter snake giving birth to all albino babies. 28 of them crawled out of her vent. It was really weird. Um, that's not something you see every day. It was in captivity, by the way. Um, have They have backbones, of course. And if they have toes, they have claws on those toes. Okay. So a salamander will never scratch you. Because it's got toes, but it's got no claws because it's an amphibian, right? All those others that have claws could scratch you theoretically. So in terms of reptiles and in Texas, in Texas, there are 45 native species in Texas and plus six that have been introduced. One crocodile or one member of the crocodile family, the American alligator, 30 native species of turtles plus an introduced species. And in snakes, it gets really confusing. There are 72 native species but if you separate out all the subspecies, there's 115. So there's a lot of diversity of snakes in the state of Texas. We'll start real quick with the lizards, uh, just to kind of, and I'm, I'm focused mostly on those critters that you're gonna find, have a potential to find around here in the hill country, okay? Otherwise we'd be here until about three in the morning. So one of the most common lizards we have, how many of you have seen an ornate tree lizard? Good for you, because they're hard to find. They're common, but they're so well camouflaged. You can see on the photograph on the left, especially, 
blends in pretty good. These are arboreal, small or arboreal li lizards. That means they live in the trees primarily. They're very cryptic and they are ambush hunters. So they sit there hot hidden and wait for something to come, come, come by and get close enough and then they grab it. So that is their hunting style. And they breed throughout their season. Most of them will start showing up in March and they'll go all the way to November potentially. And they can lay several clutches of eggs. Then we have the Texas spiny lizard. Most people think around here of all the lizards in the state that we get requests about to help ID, um, it's this one because most people think it's a what? A, a horn lizard. Yeah, they really do. They think it's a Texas horn lizard. And they're always very disappointed when I have to explain to them why it's not. Um, but they are also an arboreal species, but much larger than the tree lizard we just showed. I just showed you. Um, and they are really good climbers. You can see they have extraordinarily long toes and, and uh, are very good. This is one that uh, instead of freezing all the time, what it likes to do, if it, you see one on a tree and you get try to get a little close to it, it runs around to the backside of the tree. And you literally could start walking around the other side of the tree and it'll just keep going like this. Um, I don't I don't know how for how long, but but it will do that. It can lay up to four clutches of eggs per year. Um, and um, its prey includes everything that you'd expect. And all of these are mostly eating invertebrates, but cicadas, grasshoppers, butterflies, they have quite a wide diversity of, di of uh, diet. And then I want to show you the Texas horned lizard. This map, and it's going to be a little hard to see, the little, if you can see them, there's little red dots that show where they've been found in Texas. You'll notice the hill country is largely absent. Um, I'm guessing a lot of you, if you lived here all your life, remember when they were very abundant. Yeah, there are efforts to try to reintroduce them in places around the state. The two of our big zoos are working on that right now um, with the hopes that in some of these areas, if the their food supply recovers, then it's potentially uh, a, a site that they could release these uh, these horned lizards. Ants, yeah, harvester ants. So those big ant, you know, where you sit, where you find the harvester ants, and it's a big bare spot, and the ants are going in and out, and then they're dumping their garbage, their used food out there. Those are the ones they're after. The problem is fire ants have been a major reason why these guys have declined, and then just just flat out habitat loss. So there's the comparison, and frankly, I don't see the similarity. <laughs> <laughs> but but we have we have a bit of a, more of a trained eye, I suspect. Uh, but there you go. Yes. Well, that's what Andy Glusen Camp and his folks are working with people uh, out of the San Antonio Zoo to identify. So if somebody makes a request, then they can go out and check their habit, their land and see. Uh, but that's that's their deal. So we're, we're letting them have their deal. They've been released as a test at uh, Mason Mountain Wildlife Management Area. And la this last year, they had their first evidence of breeding by some of the released critters. Um, and they radio collar them with a little tag that they wear with an antenna to track them. And, and I have to tell you that following around a you know, a two to three inch lizard in sand at, the, at Mason Mountain. If you've ever been there, that soil, they, it all looks alike. Um, but um, Terry, my wife, actually found one when most of us didn't find one one day, the one time we were up there looking for him. So pretty cool. So then we have the Texas spotted whiptail. This, in, this is not an arboreal species. This is a guy who runs very quick across the ground, um, as you all know. And this is one that um, people want to try to grab. They grab the tail and the tail comes off. Uh, and uh, it does grow back, but you can always tell a, one of these guys if it's lost its tail uh, from a predator or something else because there's always a little bump where the new tail grew out from. Uh, but have any of you ever done that and ended up with a tail? And it sits there and wiggles for a while. A little creepy, right? But it's a great, great strategy for escaping. Because the predator is now wrestling with this little thing that's wiggling back and forth, and the and the lizard is long gone. 
and by the way, all lizards can't do that. <laughs> and uh, some, a lot of people think they can. So I'm guessing there's some lizards that really get hurt badly um, from time to time. Um, then we have the, uh, and, and I should, let me go back to that one. If you'll notice on this slide, the spotted part comes from two rows of spots on the side of the body on the flanks. And that's what helps identify this guy from the six line race runner, which is around here, probably less common, has a wide range, uh, eats about the same thing, inhabits the same spaces, but you'll notice it does not have any of those spots on the side of the body. Uh, but but if it's running around and it's going really fast, sometimes it's hard to know. And here's the comparison. You can see the spots versus the lack of spots on those two. Look at those back toes. Awesome looking. Then we have also, and, and out here, when you start getting into the heart of the hill country, crevice spiny lizards become a little more common. They're living in the... Um, uh, well, the crevices uh, <laughs> of, of the rocky areas out here. And uh, they're a real flat lizard. They can get very flat, so they can squeeze in to uh, very narrow places between the rocks. The other thing, you'll notice how large their scales are. Those scales are very rough, so when they get, they get wedged in, it, trying to get them out is almost impossible because all those scales kind of grab, grip the, uh, I'm told, grip the rocks and make them hard to, to uh, extract. They are sit and wait predators. So again, they're like the fence, li the tree lizard where they'll sit and wait for the critter to come close. Um, they are a live bearing lizard. So they're not laying eggs. They're actually giving birth to live baby lizards. I think this is my favorite lizard. How many of you have seen an alligator lizard? Cool, they're very cool and they're very aggressive. And they have a lot of teeth that are very sharp. Um, when I first moved to Texas, I was volunteering at Old Tunnel. Um, and I there was one in the bath with a, I think it was the girl women's bathroom. And I said, I'll go get it. And I went in there and I grabbed it and it grabbed me. And by the time I released it, there was a lot of blood on that one finger. Uh, it was just chomping on me. And this was that that lizard, and I got down there to take a picture of it, and it kind of reared up like that, like, just try that again. Um, but a really neat lizard. This is one of the most frequently collected lizard by people in the pet trade. They want to have them, which can actually have a negative impact on their populations. Um, but they're still a fairly secure uh, critter, um, but they sure are neat. Their range is really strange. It goes all the way out to the Chisos Mountains, through Del Rio and then back to here in just a very narrow band. So where I live in Bernie, I've never seen one. Then it turned, I wanted to throw one skink in before we get to the, the rest of these critters. Um, this is the ground skink. So if you've ever been out walking in the woods and you see some movement through the leaves, that's probably a ground skink. Little tiny brown. Notice how slick it is. It looks almost like a salamander. It has scales. They're just very smooth, shiny scales. Um, but they're out there eating tiny little insects, tiny little spiders, and they're all over the place. We just never notice them. Okay, briefly, turtles. Kegel's map turtle found only in the Guadalupe River basin. From here all the way down towards Victoria, I think. So this is these are iNaturalist sightings. So it's possible that they can be found here. This is one of the species that there's been enough done, research done. I think with the new list, it's coming off the SGCN list. So it's doing better than what formerly it was thought to be doing. Then we have river cooters and red-eared sliders. They look a lot alike. One has a red ear, the one down in the lower right-hand corner, which you can't hardly see the red. Um, but they're very similar, very common along all of our streams. There's that red. And then there's the pancake turtle. How many of you have seen these little guys? And they get huge. They have a soft shell. That, that's the name, soft shell. Um, and they can bite. They don't have teeth. But the edge of the turtle's mouth is a hard keratin-type bony structure. And I had a program one time. We happened to have one of these guys. you got to hold on to them because they're, they're, their um, neck can stretch so far out and go all the way over their back. 
you always have to hold them by the back of their their uh, a big one. You have to hold by the back of their uh, their their shell. And I was with a group of kids, and I was showing it around. And I said, "Now, whatever you do, don't put your finger close to its head." And some and these fifth graders, some fifth grade kid sitting there. He, of course, he's going to show his buddies what he can do. And pretty soon, the the uh, turtle and him were connected. And he was yelling, and I said, I looked at him. I said, what did I tell you? Um, and he bled a little bit, but as far as I know, he lived. Um, but they're, they're an aggressive turtle. They really are. And then we have uh, other SGCNs are our box turtles, um, the ornate box turtle. There are very few sightings around here. I suspect they were at one time more common, um, but there still are a few, but they're mostly now up in the northeastern part of the state by and large. And the three-toed box turtle the same way. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these get captured for the pet trade, illegal pet trade. And um, and then what happens, they get sold to people. And of course, these turtles can live 30 or 40 years. And so the kids grow up. The parents don't want the turtle anymore. They just release it wherever they think it can go. And most of those turtles, uh, through research, it's shown that they've died. Uh, because they're very territorial. And because you live that long, it'd be like, you know, taking burn here and going, Hey, we're going to put you on Mars. And Oh, by the way, good luck with that. Um, so you're, you're, you're just, it's, it's a failed, a failed effort. Um, even though people might have the best of intent. And then of course there's the Texas tortoise. This is another really cool turtle and you can see it's more of a Southern turtle, but there's been sightings all around San Antonio up into, um, Bear County come out or, um, Kendall County and uh, a little bit in Comal County. But they, too, are declining because of uh, habitat loss. And they love to eat prickly pear. So if you have a lot of prickly pear, no, I'm just, no, probably wouldn't work. All right, let's talk about what you came here for tonight. Snakes. Um, so true or false, quiz time. Snakes are slimy. Exactly. Why do you think people think they're slimy? The the look, they real shiny. That's yeah, right. And when you touch them, they're slick, but they're very dry. But a lot of people think they are slimy, even when they've got them right in front of them. False, of course. Snakes sting with their tongues or tails. I'm guessing that means you think that that's false. So there are a lot of people think that's exactly what they do. And there is a snake that I'm going to show you that has, thank you, that has a pointed tail that it will use to poke into you. Blind, a blind snake. But that's, that's more for defense. Hoop snakes are real. So anybody heard of a hoop snake? This is the old story back in the pioneer days where snakes would... Uh, put their tail in their mouth and then roll down a hill chasing you. And then they would, they would take their tail out of their mouth and shoot through the air like a spear to bite you. Um, yes. That, I, I've seen, I've seen the drawings of hoop snakes. Yes. In books. Uh, false. They can hypnotize their prey. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. Uh, that's false. They can suck. Milk from cows. So how do you think the milk snake got its name? Hung around cows or sheep and, you know, whatever. Uh, that's false, in case you were wondering. And snakes chase people. So snakes may come in your direction because that's the way they're going, but they're not like chasing people. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the other version of uh, hoop snakes, and that's false too. So snakes are cold-blooded. They lay generally lay leathery eggs. Um, some have live birth. They periodically shed their skin as they grow. Um, they use their tongue for for smelling. Uh, and again, there's 72 species of snakes, or 105, depending on how many subspecies. Only 11 are considered dangerous to us. <laughs> we say only 11. <laughs> Only 11. 
<laughs> and Texas has got lots of them. So, and of course, as they move, they different snakes move in different ways. You can see the patterns there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with that. Um, they ingest their prey in one long bite. They don't, however, separate their jaws. That's how I was taught. Oh, yeah, they pull their jaws apart, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they don't. They actually have um, uh, flexible tissue between their two front jaws on the lower end and between the upper jaw or the skull and the lower jaw that they can stretch to take that and take in a food item much larger than than they are. And of course, all their teeth are angled backwards. So when they do bite, then they walk over their prey. And every bite takes those teeth that are pointed backwards and pulls it farther and farther into the body, into the, into the cavity. And of course, a lot of snakes do it by constriction. Some, some like the garter snake, grabs its prey and just gobbles it down. A, a lot of snakes obviously grab their prey, wrap around it. And every time the, the critter breathes out, they squeeze a little more. And there's less breathing going on, so they end up suffocating their prey. Or, of course, they can use venom. Um, and, and these are not poisonous snakes. What are they? Venomous snakes. Yes, yes. Poisonous snakes would indicate that we're eating them and made us sick. So these are venomous snakes. They have heat sensing pits. If you get that close to have, you can actually see those pits. You're probably too close. Okay. But those are for uh, finding warm blooded prey. And you can see that uh, when that mouth's open, pretty bad. Um, venom potency. The, if it's the closer you are to zero on this scale, the more potent it is. Yeah. So the Mojave rattlesnake is the most potent. The coral snake second on this list. The copperhead is the least venomous. Um, that doesn't mean you should go and try it out and see how you react, but um, that is uh, there. And venomous versus non-venomous, the most obvious thing is the shape of the eye. If you Again, if you have to get that close, then you're too close, right? Uh, generally, of course, some people, you know, we talk about rattlesnakes and the rattling. They don't always rattle. It's not because of wild pigs, by the way. Um, a lot of people say that rattlesnakes don't rattle anymore because they are, because there's so many wild hogs around. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Think about this evolutionarily. If a snake is attacked, two snakes are sitting there and one snake gets eaten by the, the, the hog because it rattled its tail, the other snake goes, well, I'd rather not do that. Okay, but most snakes aren't together unless it's hibernation, right, or brumation. So the chances of if you're if you are you, you get eaten because you're rattling your tail and you're dead, how are you going to pass it on to all your other buddies that you shouldn't rattle your tail? Um, so that's really kind of a bogus deal. Yes. Yeah, see, how, and it may be a little hard to see, but that slit, kind of like a cat eye, they have a slit for a pupil. This one has a round pupil. Is the non-venomous. The one with the slit is venomous. Yes. So here's some common snakes of the Texas Hill Country. We'll start with the venomous ones. Um, Western cottonmouth, that's a... A baby, by the way, or the lower one is a baby, has a little, it almost looks like a copperhead um, pattern. And uh, you don't want to mess with these. They're short, fat, and mean. Um, they, they have a bad attitude. They really do. Uh, they will travel over land. Uh, they have, uh, they eat a lot of fish and frogs. They're aquatic, mostly aquatic uh, venomous snakes. And they do not uh, form big mats and float through the river and attack people on horseback and bite them to death, like you saw on Lonesome Dove, um, that uh, has never been documented ever except in that book. Okay. And that's a great book and a great movie. However, Cottonmouth, yeah, the mo water moccasin, yeah, same thing. Yep. And there are several water snakes that look a lot like this and are also very aggressive, but they're not venomous. I'll show you the two species around here that are the most common in a little bit. 
I'm going the wrong way again. See, that thing should mean advancing. All right, then we have we have in our area the broad banded copperhead, and I've seen a couple of them in the hill country, and they look very pink, just beautiful snakes. They're generally docile. Um, I've I've walked right over the top of them. They've never struck. I've been crawling around under brush and had one, you know, a few inches from my hand as I was grabbing a plant. Never struck. Um, I'm not suggesting you should go try. Um, but they're kind of stocky snakes. They only get about uh, 30 inches long at the biggest. Um, they're slow moving. And again, they're just kind of chill. So there's just not, they're not an aggressive snake like a rattlesnake or anything like that. But it, you'll notice at the bottom, it says second leading venomous snake in terms of bites to humans. So they're out there and they're plentiful. But we have three subspecies in Texas. And this is our subspecies in this part of the state. Then we have the coral snake, and there's all kinds of stories about the coral snake, and it, its mouth is too small to bite you. I don't know if you noticed on the list of venom ranking, it's bad. And so it doesn't take much of a bite to get you, um, and they can bite, and it can be very deadly. Um, but they're gorgeous snakes. If I had more time, I'd tell you a great story, but I don't have enough time. But the saying, of course, is red on, fellow kill, or red on yellow, kill a fellow, red on black, friend of jack. So there's the milk snake for comparison. But these are pretty common snakes out there, but they're, and even as bright as they are, it's amazing how few of them I ever see. But when I do see one, it's always, whoa. So those cryptic colors kind of tell you to leave me alone. And that's the best thing you can do. And of course, we have the Western Diamondback uh, with its rattles. They're awesome snakes. Um, I almost stepped on the one that, no, I had my hand on about four inches from the one on the left. It was curled up in a little uh, old armadillo hole. And I was picking up a rock. It never rattled and it just sat there. Never struck. I've walked right over that same snake in other situations. Um, and so I've had a lot of encount close encounters, but have not, um, fortunately, have not been struck. Um, and the only reason that guy on the right was rattling is because I irritated it. Uh, it was a hot day in the summertime and it wanted me to leave it alone. Um, but they are uh, definitely a species to watch out for. And if you have snake boots when you're out wandering around, that's probably the best thing to have on just in case. Um, or else you're walking with a group of people, always be first and let the second or third person get struck. Um, that's what I've always been told. Now, <laughs> Now, in terms of those rattles, you cannot age a rattlesnake by counting rattles. They grow rattles. As you can see, it starts out with a bud. Then they grow another one and another one. Internally, the rattling comes from the fact that they're hollow and, as, and there's space in between them. So as they shake, they're actually causing that vibration. Um, and they break off frequently. And I, I have talked to a lot of old Texans that go, yeah, I had a 16-year-old rattlesnake. And it's because they had 16 rattles on it. Um, it's just they hadn't broke off. Um, but just so you know that that's kind of an old wives tale. And now we'll get into some snakes that won't hurt you. This one will slime you good. How many of you have seen a, uh, been digging in a garden or uh, in the ground and found one of these guys? They're blind. They have just, just you see the little dot of an eye. Um, they can't see. They live underground. And there, you'll notice their tail and their head are about the same shape. And that tail has is sharp, is kind of sharp pointed. And I, I, when I was handling this one in the upper picture, it was using its tail and going like this and poking at me. And it actually has a little point off. Yeah, put me down. Um, but they feed on ants and termites, so they're actually pretty beneficial little snakes to have around. And they're super slimy, um, and it makes it hard to hold on to them, actually. But they're very, very tiny ones. Um, most of the ones I see are no more than six or eight inches long, but they can get up to 11. And then we have other small snakes, the brown snake, uh, which is, well, brown. Um, you'll notice there's a brown mark behind the head and then a brown stripe below the eye on the lower jaw to help you identify it. Usually only about a foot long. Notice their diet is worms, slugs, snails, and insect larvae. Another another good snake to have around. And these are live-bearing snakes, so they give birth to 
actual babies coming out of their vent. Then we have the western ground snake, probably not as common. It's a wide range across Texas, um, but they eat spiders and egg sacs, insects, centipedes, and ant eggs. Uh, again, a very small snake, not, lot, not encountered all the time, and can be confused with some of the other small brownish snakes, including the rough earth snake. Um, these guys eat slugs, earthworms. The reason I point this diet thing out is because a lot of times we don't give credit. We think of snakes and we think they eat mice. But these guys are out here preying on all kinds of things that are can be a, a problem. Just like kind of like wasps. Wasps as adults nectar on flowers and spread pollen, but they capture other prey and feed those to their babies. So they're very, very beneficial, even though a lot of people don't like them. And then here's our eastern black-necked garter snake. Beautiful, beautiful snake. You'll notice it has this black mark behind the eye, the bright orange stripe running down the, the back. Absolutely beautiful snake. It's alive. All the garter snakes give birth to live uh, young. Um, it's a frog and toad, so it's going to be close to the water most of the time. That's where you're going to find it. Um, I've seen them in water tanks, people's uh, metal water tanks. They'll crawl up there and hunt the frogs that are singing in there. And then another one you find on the landscape is the checkered garter snake. The classic garter snake really isn't that common in the hill country. The straw stripey snake. These two are our most common. Um, they, again, frogs, toads, tadpoles, lizards. Um, and uh, they're another really beautiful snake. Here's a comparison of the two. So you can see one has the reddish stripe. One has the yellow stripe. Notice also the solid black top of the head versus the brown head with that yellow dot right in the middle. So checkered garter snake is on the right. Yep. And the black necked garter snake is on the left. Yep. Now just to confuse you a little more, we have the ribbon snake which for all the world looks like a garter snake. <laughs> but here's the diff. Well, so these are fish. These are frog eating snakes as well and small fish and tadpoles. And so they're around water as well. Um, you'll notice the picture on the lower right. Frog, frog, leaping frog. Smart frog. Smart frog. <laughs> well, both, you know, the camo ones might be just as smart. Uh, but he, he looks like he's, he's going to land on it. Um, but I watched this snake one night feeding on these, these cricket frogs. I mean, they just put the hammer down. Um, they are really good at finding these cricket frogs. Uh, but a beautiful little snake. And just to kind of show you the difference between a ribbon snake, a primary difference between a ribbon snake and a garter snake, notice the black st stripes on the jaw. The jaw line of a ribbon snake doesn't have any markings. That's a way to tell them uh, differently, different species. And then we have another snake with lots of beautiful lines. This is the Texas patch nose snake. It gets its nose because it, its nose scale is really well developed for digging through hard, rocky soil. Fantastic. How much time do I have? None? Can I keep going? Sorry. I'm kind of notorious for this. Then we have the Western Coach Whip, long, fast-moving snake. I'm assuming most of you have encountered these guys. One of the neat behaviors they have is called periscoping, where they'll actually raise up above the grass and they'll look around. Yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. They can do that. So kind of a neat behavior. They will eat anything they can catch. I've, I've got video of one eating a rattlesnake. And the rattlesnake had actually bit it on the side of the body. There was blood dripping out of the, the, the uh, tooth marks. But that rattlesnake was no more. So apparently they are not affected by that, that venom. So really neat snake. Well, speaking of neat snakes, how many of you have encountered the hog nose? How many of you have seen it play dead? Or, or hiss? blow it, you know, look like a cobra, all of that. This is a great snake for being uh, very um, 
much more aggressive. They'll do fake strikes at you, but their mouth is closed. So, um, however, they are semi venomous. They have rear fangs. They eat toads. They're specialists on toads, among other things, but toads. And you know how toads, when you hold one, it swells up with water uh, to kind of defend itself. And then it will release all that water and you'll go, oh, it's peeing on me. Um, I'm told that it's water. I've never tasted it, um, but I'm told it's water. But that rear fang, when they get the toad caught, they can the rear, rear fangs can peer, can pop, basically pop the toad. Yeah, pop goes the toad. Um, and of course, here's their behaviors. Here's one that's coiling up like a cobra. And then there's where it plays dead. And apparently, if you take one that's playing dead and flip it back on its stomach, it'll flip back over. Yeah. I've never been able to see that, but I've, I've heard that's true. But uh, it looks pretty dead there <laughs> in terms of that picture. Then, of course, the Texas rat snake, one of the best cl tree climbing snakes there is. They'll get into all kinds of bird nests. Other thing, I've seen rat snakes like this on the side of dead cottonwood trees where all the bark had fallen off, and they're just stuck to it like glue and just ever so slowly working their way up those slick, that slick wood. Um, gosh, there's so many stories. <laughs> I don't have time. And then one of our biggest, bulkiest snakes that I, I've, this one I photographed out at Seminole Canyon. I've never seen one in the hill country. Have any of you seen bull snakes in the hill country? Either is there, I just don't think they're that common. Yeah, Big Bend area, they're much more common out in Big Bend. Yeah, yeah. Shake. Exactly. And they'll they'll do that rattle. They'll do strikes. They'll hiss at you. I mean, they'll kind of puff up and blow air out at you. Um, uh, but they're pretty harmless snakes. They really are. Um, yes. Oh, you have? Okay, good. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah, good, good. Well, it's a big snake. They can get to six or seven feet long. Um, they eat, they'll eat everything from, ra you know, small rabbits to whatever they can catch. Um, great, great snake. And then they're, the only one of these I've ever seen was a roadkill in Guadalupe River State Park one night with a Great Plains rat snake. And one of the characteristics of this snake is they have this diamond-shaped pattern on the top of their head. That there's only one other snake that has that, and the other one's not found around here. Here's our two diamond bat, our two water snakes I wanted to share with you. Non venomous, but really aggressive. I've known snake hunters that will only use snake sticks to pick these guys up. Uh, but then that one guy that does snake sampling down at Bernie at Cibolo. Yeah, Dave, I think is his name. He pulls one of those out of an aquarium one time and goes, Here. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't have any choice but to grab it, but it didn't bite me. But uh, they are really aggressive snakes um, living, of course, in riverine habitats and often confused for water moccasins. And then the blotched water snake, beautiful snake, another one that eats fish and frogs and and uh, just an absolutely lovely snake to see out there in the landscape. And uh, there you go. Speaking of eating frogs... <laughs> Yeah, I photographed that at a pond. So they are, uh, I notice I use the word cantankerous. So threats to snakes in particular, we're just about to wrap up. Habitat loss is one of the big ones. Here's one that I didn't realize, but it makes sense. As we lose habitat, not only do we lose the predators, we lose the prey that the predators need. So some snakes are, just, are declining um, due to that, the lack of prey. Um, part of a lot of it, and this is where you all can you all can contribute a lot, is people just don't like snakes, and we've got to get people over that. Um, that snakes are valuable on the landscape. Um, and then there's this disease, uh, snake fungal disease, which is um, somewhat. It's in the same group of uh, fungus that is affecting our bats. And there, uh, one of my um, ment mentors, mentees is now in graduate school studying that disease um, up at uh, Texas, uh, up in uh, uh, Tyler at the university up there. And it's been found in 23 states and it's characterized by sores and then uh, head deformations that uh, cause the snake to starve. 
and it's spreading through snake families all the way across the board. And they're concerned that this could become very widespread. I don't think they've documented it in Texas, but they've got it in Louisiana. So, and it's spreading West, kind of like what white nose syndrome did. So again, one of these emerging diseases that's impacting our wildlife. So the importance of snakes, of course, they're important as predators. They're important as a food supply for other animals. Um, I have eaten rattlesnake. I had one bite of rattlesnake. It needed a lot of batter or something. Because it was not that good. And it did not taste like a chicken. <laughs> so they might have just cooked it wrong. Um, of course, the hides of snakes are used by our, our purposes. All kinds of things. Whoops, wrong button. And I just think they're fascinating critters. I mean, I... I it's alarming when I run into a rattlesnake, but I, it's still just really cool, you know? Um, not that I want to get bitten or anybody else get bitten. I threw this slide in here where they're doing this voluntary survey um, to, um, so the federal government, we get our funding from the federal government. One of the things they want us to, they want us to collect demographic information basically is what I think it boils down to. You can take this, take that uh, scan thing and, and do that. It's voluntary, uh, but it's a requirement for us to keep getting our funding. So there you go. But I'll leave that to you. But I did my job. Did it well. There you go. I, I apologize for going over the limit. And you did your job and I failed you. So do we have many questions online? Okay. Who do we contact to get Tony Toad to introduce the place? Andy Glusenkamp at the San Antonio Zoo. And, 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 and they're still probably two or three years out from starting to place them in any kind of numbers, but that would be who the, the contact is. Andy used to be our state herpetologist. Um, good guy. All right. Well, thank you very much for putting up with me, and uh, sorry we went a little over. Uh, but hopefully it was worth it. Thank you all very much. I don't like snakes. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. And that wraps up tonight. We'll see you next month.